I really appreciated the invitation to come speak to you all here today. And so, Engineering America is the title of my talk. First, I want to talk about beer. <laughs> all right, it's a college campus. I can get away with this. Um, but the reason why I want to talk about beer in a discussion on science, technology, engineering, and math is because I want to talk about spending, American spending on beer. A hundred billion dollars a year. Just Americans, okay? California has about 12% of the population, so let's say, I don't think it's crazy to say that, okay, so Californians spend $12 billion a year on beer. So now let's talk about how much money we spend on educating our K through 12 children in the critical areas of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So California spends $68 billion a year on education, K through 12 education in, in California. But you could gather that less than half of that $68 billion actually goes to instruction or materials for students. Um, so if less than 50% of $68 billion goes to the actual teaching of the children, I'm going to guess that maybe 10% of that $68 billion goes towards teaching our children science, technology, engineering, and math. And I came up with that. It wasn't super scientific. 10%, 6.8 billion, what California spends on educating their youth in STEM education. Also not super fair because local governments also contribute pretty strongly. Let's say 50%. So 6.8 plus 50% ends up at about $11 billion. $12 billion on beer, $11 billion on teaching our youth how to be scientists, engineers, technologies, and mathematicians. Even if I'm off by a factor of two, and I'm perfectly willing to say I could be off by that much, to first order, Americans are willing to spend the same amount on beer as they're willing to invest in their children in these critical areas that are going to drive the future economy. So why does this concern me? It's not all restaurants, all alcohol, it's just beer. I think it's starting to affect uh, Americans and the economy. Um, this is the less inspirational part of my talk, so bear with me. I'll try to whip through this. The United States exited the 20th century as the world's economic leader, as well as the world's leading innovator. Things have changed dramatically, surprisingly, in the 10 years since the end of the 20th century. Well, 13, but most of my data ends in 2010. American economy has a hard time generating new jobs. In addition, after a recession or after uh, an economic crisis, it takes us three times longer now to gain those jobs back as it did late in the 20th century. Middle class. So always talk about the middle class, but the middle class is critically important to any economy. They are the ones that do the majority of the buying. They fuel the economy. They drive the economy. And our middle class is not doing well. You don't hear about it so much. I know Mr. Obama is really trying to get people to think about it. But when I was preparing this, it's, it's actually pretty frightening. 20% of the US population owns 80% of the wealth. Wealth is different from income, so let's talk about income. Real household median income f rose 20% from 1980 to 1999. From 2000 to 2007, so before the 2008 recession, real median income in the United States fell from $53,700 to $52,000. So in seven years, Median in, household median income fell. By the way, the top 1% still increased continuously 4 or so percent annually, even after the recession. So you want a strong middle class. Ours is not headed in that direction. Manufacturing. The US used to own advanced technology manufacturing. I was actually surprised by that. So late in the 20th century, we owned advanced products manufacturing, computers, other high-tech equipment. We ran a trade, so we ran a trade surplus up until 2002. Since in 2010, we run an $81 billion annual trade deficit in advanced technology projects. We've lost the ability to produce and manufacture. As an engineer, why do I care about that? If you design a product and ship it overseas, they get all the great learning, because they're learning how to build it, they're seeing what issues you can have, they could see how the manufacturing plays into the operation, they get all that good feedback that we should be feeding back into our design. We've lost that. 
And at SpaceX, we've seen it firsthand. To find critical production leadership, we actually had to go overseas. We hired a bunch of people away from Mini. Uh, BMW, who owns Mini, hates us now. They block our emails, and they won't let us call any of their people, because we stole most of their leadership. But God bless America. <laughs> Innovation. I think this is the place where Americans feel super comfortable. We're the innovative leaders. We've all heard about American ingenuity. We're number one. Wrong. We were number one in the 20th century. We are number four in the 21st century. There are three countries above us that have an economy and the infrastructure for that economy that drives innovation more than us. So what are, what are those infrastructure pieces? The number of science, technologists, engineers, and mathematics, the amount of R&D investment from corporations and government, we certainly aren't doing that. Uh, how are, is our trade doing, surplus or deficit, and the amount of venture capital available. So we're number four. Infrastructure. Our highways suck, our airports are inefficient, we have harbors that can't accommodate the most modern transport ships. The worst part is that Americans do not have access to particularly fast internet. The internet is the highway to the 21st century economy. We are number 13 in internet speeds. Number one is South Korea. They have internet speeds that are 200 times faster than what we can get, and they pay half the price. Now let's talk about 200 times faster than what we can get. What we get in cities is faster than what we can get across in rural America. In addition, it's so expensive in the United States that it's proving to be another differentiator between your middle class or your lower middle class and your upper class. Inner city folks can't afford internet. I have a ranch in rural Texas. I can't pay for fast internet. It's just not available. So again, we're continuing to see this eroding infrastructure and the demonstration that the United States is not going to be able to participate in the 21st century economy. Finally, kind of my passion outside of working on space technology is education. But for the first time in 2009, the US scored below average in math scores in kind of a standardized international test. Our peer group in this test is Portugal, Italy, Ireland, and Spain. Number one is South Korea. Average is Austria. So why, why is this a problem for me? Because STEM graduates earn 26% more than any other. So we're talking about boosting the economy. STEM graduates are gonna, are gonna make more money. We produce STEM jobs 3x faster than any other job in the United States. Uh, and so I, I really feel like this is the key to kind of forcing the US into the future that they don't seem to want to be forced into. So let's define engineering. Engineering is the application of knowledge in order to design, build, operate, and maintain things. What kind of knowledge? Scientific, it can be economic, it can be political, it can be analytical. And what are the things that I'm talking about? Structures, machines, devices, systems, materials, and even processes. So you guys are, there's probably more engineers in here than we thought at the beginning of the talk, and I'm gonna make you raise your hand again. I remember vividly when I was a 15-year-old girl, that's the day that I learned what an engineer was, because my mother, I was an ornery teen, and my mother dragged me to a Society of Women Engineers event down at the Illinois Institute of Technology. I grew up in the Chicago area. And I had this great connection with this mechanical engineer that was there giving up her Saturday to talk to ornery teenage girls like myself. I loved what she was doing. She was a mechanical engineer. She had a fabulous suit, beautiful shoes. I was like, I'm going to be a mechanical engineer. <laughs> it's as flaky as that. And I decided I would be a mechanical engineer that day. And I never changed. I applied to one university, finished my mechanical engineering degree. And now I'm running SpaceX. So I love that woman. I wish I could find her. Um, Let's talk about another engineer who's actually known as an inventor, Thomas Edison. The only reason he's known as an inventor is because engineers suck at marketing themselves. He's totally an engineer. He designed a voting booth. 
He designed the phonograph. He designed the long-lasting um, light bulb. He actually didn't invent the light bulb, but the long-lasting one that's actually usable, he did it. Distributed power systems and power grids, he invented it. 1,100 patents. He was only surpassed as a great innovator in 2004. So Thomas Edison said, we don't know one millionth of 1% about anything. I think he was saying, because humans are puny and we shouldn't be arrogant intellectual elitists, um, I want to turn it around a little bit. I want to say we don't know one millionth of 1% about anything because we make everything so complicated. Everything we work on, it, we just complicate things. Um, engineers, the best, most elegant engineering solution is the simplest solution. It tends to be the most reliable, tends to be the lowest price. At SpaceX, our rockets are actually quite simple. Two stages versus our competitors that have three to five. Less hardware, less opportunity for failure. And for those of you that own the remotes at home, it should only take one remote and one button to turn on your TV. <laughs> I think that's mostly the men here. Genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. So what am I trying to say here? Work hard and you can solve any problem. There is nothing that's so scary that you can't go solve it with hard work. And a little bit of knowledge and some elbow grease, et cetera. Um, at SpaceX, we knew developing engines would be really hard. We didn't know we would be developing the end caps on our domes or on our tanks. It's called spin forming. It's a crazy technology. It seems really dangerous to do, but we've mastered that. We build our own heat shield, tile, heat shield tiles for the bottom of the Dragon capsule. So uh, we knew we had to invent it. Um, we did it. It was hard. We spent a lot of investment doing it. But we weren't afraid of trying that new thing, trying to build that new technology. We need to quit being afraid of failure. We really need to rebrand this concept of failure. And for the students, I'm not talking about that gives you permission to fail your tests. It's not the kind of failure. I'm talking about when you're trying to do something new and you're trying to innovate, you're trying to develop, should not be afraid of failure. You should be totally willing to invest something, build something, test it, and fail it, because then you've learned. Thomas Edison, when he was de developing the long life light bulb, he said he has not failed 10,000 times. He had not failed once. He had succeeded in proving that those 10,000 ways will not work. That's rebranding failure. I love that. This is the Merlin engine on our test, test stand in Texas. We've tweaked the design of this system hundreds of times. This is probably somewhere between the 150th and 160th version of this engine, but it's a screamer. We had a bunch of failures early on in testing. They're quite dynamic. This is the first stage test getting tested in Central Texas as well. Learned a lot on the last vehicle, and now we're working on the new one. This is the fairing that, holds this, that protects the satellite during the heating of ascent. It's giant, it's 17 foot diameter, it's about 50 feet tall. It's a living room that basically opens up to allow the satellite to be exposed to space so we can pop it off in orbit. And here's our second stage. It's so important to build and test, even if you're afraid that it's gonna fail. Build and test, build and test. The final test that I'm gonna show you is of our Grasshopper project. This is, we're trying to develop the technologies to get reusability rockets to be reusable, like aircraft are reusable. This is really this is so exciting, no one does this. So we're five for five, testing on that grasshopper, yay. But, but, but that means we're not pushing hard enough. We, gotta, we have to tunnel one of those vehicles into the ground by trying something really hard, we haven't done that yet. So now our, our challenge to our test team is we gotta, you got to push hard enough that we're going to see something happen. A, a spectacular video. That's a spectacular video. Failures are very spectacular. <laughs> OK. My final quote, restlessness and discontent are the first necessities of progress. Show me a thoroughly satisfied man, and I will show you a failure. Lesson learned here, engineers are never satisfied. Is there a spouse of an engineer in the, office, in the audience? OK, they're never done. I'm never done. Tweaking and tweaking, they piss the sales team off incredibly. <laughs> However, what's so important about that is that you never really are done. You should be a perfectionist. 
You got to roll something out, you got to get it operational, but figure out how you're going to fix it. We did a great thing in the 60s and the 70s. We sent men to the moon. Did we continue on? Did we explore the universe with humans? Did we go to Mars? Nope. We drew the line. We said we were done. And then we just started going to low Earth orbit, with the inter visiting the International Space Station with the shuttle. But we stopped in space. And then in 2011, when we retired the shuttle, Americans can no longer take their own astronauts to space. We pay the Russians $70 million per seat to fly our astronauts to the International Space Station. SpaceX is trying to fix that. I want to roll a video of the area that we're working on right now. We're taking a cargo ship to the International Space Station. Hopefully in two years you'll be seeing crew. It's short, it's only a minute and a half. Final go, no go, pull for launch. All stations respond and pull. Sys-1 is go. CC-1 is go. Flight software is go. Nav-1 is go. And MB is go. Three, two, one. And liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon. Falcon 9 is clear to go. My employees. continues America's mission to resupply the International Space Station. Vehicle supersonic. Separation confirmed. And condition confirmed. All stations, MB Mission A, successful Dragon F9 sub. Thank you for the ride of 9. The Dragon separating from Falcon 9 launch vehicle. We did have a problem, but you're seeing real time engineering here getting through it. Actual photos. You are go for the capture. A video. Capture is confirmed. Dragon is restoring America's capability to deliver and return significant amounts of cargo to and from the Bringing space fresh fruit and vegetables to the astronauts. There goes Dragon away from the arm. Confirmed visual on splash down. So let's continue to do cool things and inspire our youth. Thanks. <laughs>